Hello, and welcome to today's show, Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, international leadership expert and trusted advisor. Welcome to Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm so delighted that you joined me today. I have a very special guest on our show. His name is Ari Weinzweig. Now, just a few years ago, Ari was named one of the world's 10 top CEOs by Inc. Magazine. Ari is the CEO and co-founding partner of Zingerman's Community of Businesses. Now, that's a mouthful. This community of businesses includes Zingerman's Delicatessen, Bakehouse, Creamery Catering, Mail Order, Zing Train, The Coffee Company, Roadhouse, Coffee Manufactory, Events at Corman Farms, Miss Kim, and Zingerman's Food Tours. Wow, (laughs) that is quite a community. Zingerman's is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And you know, Those of you who are regular listeners to this show, I'm just going to say, go blue. That's one of my hometowns. Now, Ari was recognized as one of the who's who of food and beverage in America by the 2006 James Beard Foundation. He was also awarded a Bon Appetit Lifetime Achievement Award among his many recognitions. Ari is also a prolific author. He has written a number of articles and books, including Zingerman's Guide to Good Eating, Zingerman's Guide to Giving Great Service, Zingerman's Guide to Better Bacon, and Zingerman's Guide to Good Leading, Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. And each of these books have a unique focus. In this four-part series, there's Building a Great Business, Being a Better Leader, managing ourselves, and the power of beliefs in business. And all of Ari's books take the perspective of what he calls a lapsed anarchist. A lapsed anarchist, that's right. Now you will hear more about what that means during our conversation today. Today's topic is humility and leadership, a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I can't think of a better person, a better leader, a better human being to address this topic than Ari. Now, I met Ari in person just recently when I was in Ann Arbor attending to Family Matters, but we actually met virtually before that through my sister, Vera, who connected the two of us via email. Now, when I met Ari through his amazing newsletters and very attentive emails, and then when we finally had an opportunity to meet face-to-face right outside of his Zingerman's Roadhouse restaurant, I heard him speak so, so passionately about his business and his team, and he was just on fire about it. So I can't wait to host this incredible, humble human being, my friend and colleague, Ari. Now, before I bring Ari on, I want to take just a minute, just a moment, to connect the dots between today's topic on humility and leadership and legacy living. Now, there are many, many ways that humility and leadership connect to legacy living, which you will hear more about later. But for now, let me say that legacy living is a way of being and a way of living and moving through the world so that we make the conscious choice to be the difference we want to see in the world. We make the conscious choice now, right here, right now, not in some distant future. We make that conscious choice day in and day out, 365, 24-7. Now more about that a little bit later. Let me introduce you to my friend and colleague, Ari Weinzweig. Welcome to my podcast, Ari. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
I just want to make sure that the listeners get a chance to hear your voice before I start launching into questions. <laughs> well, I'm honored to be here with you, Gloria. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. So Ari, we are talking about humility today. And I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about how you think about humility, what it means to you, and how you have come to this place around humility. Okay, well, that was, I think that was, I'm going to be humble and say that was probably more questions than I can remember. Uh, <laughs> all of them, but I, I'm going to try to start with the last one and then work my way back to the earlier ones. So you guide me if I get off the rails. But uh, so how, how I got started on this, I, I mean, clearly, I, I, I know the word. Uh, I, I've read a lot of books in my life and written a fair few and uh, humility is not a new human concept. Uh, but the way I really started to pay attention to it was uh, the four years ago, this coming spring, uh, I got asked to speak at a little symposium on campus at University of Michigan that was about humility. And uh, my initial reaction when uh, the kind woman reached out to me to speak, and I speak pretty regularly, as do you, but my reaction was, I really don't know anything about humility. Uh, I mean, I clearly, like I said, know what the word is, but I've never spoken on it. I've never written about it. We teach a lot of classes internally. Uh, we teach a whole, we have a whole training program called Zing Train, and we have, I don't know, 12 at the time, 12 two-day seminars. Mm. None, none of it even deals with humility. And I, I'm like, I, I'd love to help you, but I don't really know anything about it. But my challenge was that the woman who had asked me used to work for us, and she's an awesomely wonderful, kind-hearted, generous human being. And her husband still works for us, and he is an equally kind and generous human being, and I just didn't have the heart to say no. So I said yes, uh, and then I figured, okay, I got five months or four months, whatever it was, to figure out what I'm going to say. And so that's really what got me to start to study it. And uh, like pretty much anything, and I, I, given the diversity of your studies, which is wonderful and inspiring, uh, I, I'm sure I'm going to guess you've had similar experience, but almost anything I, I believe that one starts to really pay attention to, it becomes very interesting. So whether I, you know, I've read a book on the history of trains, which is completely not within my normal area of interest, but once it, one starts to study it, it becomes very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what happened with humility. And so uh, I gave the talk, but then of course I kept going and I started to study it more. And I started to realize how uh, more and more, how important it was to healthy leadership to healthy organizations to really to a healthy life and then i started to look and we'll get into it but to the implications uh, both positive and then unfortunately negative of what it can do to our communities and our societies uh, when it's lacking so that's really how i got going so i'm going to right. pause there and let you ask another question so we can hear your wonderful voice too yeah that's great thank you thank you so much ari so you basically followed um, an invitation from a speaking uh, opportunity at Michigan and followed that trail and you became more and more interested. And you have actually written on this topic. Uh, yep. You published a slew of books and many, many, many pamphlets. And you have a pamphlet on humility, right? Yeah. So can you tell yep. us a little bit about that? I can. It came out last fall. Uh, this is the culminate. Well, actually, I'm still learning, but at the time it was the culmination of uh, the work that I had done that started with the that invitation to speak. Uh, it's called Humility, a Humble Anarchistic Inquiry. We can talk about anarchism later if you want. Yes. It turns out to be, I mean, it's something I've been studying for a long time and working hard on, the, on its application to progressive business and mm -hmm. to a sustainable life, I guess was a way to say it. Uh, but this is really just a summation of my learnings and how, uh, like I said, how I came to get focused on it and then what it really means how I realized in hindsight why uh, Jamie Vanderbrook had asked me to speak, which is that although I had been completely unconscious about it, we were actually doing it in a, in a healthy way within the organization. And I started to understand how uh, we had woven humility into so much of our existing training. We just didn't call out the word. Mm. But, and, and then uh, also, I started to realize how important it was for leadership skills and uh, really an important piece of the hiring and training and job expectations. Uh, and, and then lastly, I ended up with some, some different perspectives on what uh, humility is and how to frame it in a meaningful way. All right. 
Well, so you you think about humility at the intersection of leadership, at the intersection of organizational effectiveness, ecosystems, uh, but I don't want to get ahead of you. So I want to just let our listeners know we're going to go there <laughs> and talk about those different aspects of humility from your perspective, Ari. But for right now, can you just give like one or two examples of people that you would consider to be humble leaders in your own life? Well, well, uh, one of the interesting things, so uh, Patrick Lencioni, mm-hmm. whose works I know you know, mm-hmm. uh, has a book out called The Ultimate Team Player, and uh, he distills his research down to three characteristics that one ought to look for to find the ideal team player. Humble, hungry, i.e. the pursuit of mastery or greatness, mm-hmm. and what he calls smart, which doesn't mean intelligence, but more uh emotional intelligence or the ability to work collaboratively with others etc and uh, when i read those i realized that actually those three characteristics were essentially true of everyone i had really enjoyed working with over the years and so some of those include uh partners of mine so uh, paul saginaw who i started zingerman's with back march 15th 1982 we're going to have our 39th anniversary next week wow congratulations yeah. Kind of crazy. Uh, Maggie Bayless, who's the person with whom uh, we started Zing Train. She fits that bill. Frank Carollo, uh, who, who I had worked with as a when I was a dishwasher in restaurants and he was a line cook and started the bakehouse with us all, all the way on through to really most of the people I could think of that we work with as leaders in our organization. There's so many. And then also people who've inspired me uh, through philosoph- philosophical learnings and teachings around the world, many of whom, that's how I connected with you, is because we yes. share a lot of those. So people like Peter Block, um, you know, Maya Angelou, people, I just was quoting Toni Morrison and the, for the e-news I'm working on today. I mean, all, all of these people, I got Bell Hook's book on love at the top of my stack. I mean, they're all people who are coming in their own imperfect ways like all of us from places of humility and mm-hmm. uh, so I, I think really who who's not humble and I, I don't say this to place blame but I mean we it's the people who act full of themselves and I have come to believe mostly that comes out of their own internal insecurities and anxieties which we all have just that's how they deal with it and uh, in my experience it's not the most wonderful way <laughs> <laughs> to manifest it in the world, yeah. but I, I, I do, be, I believe most of us have the same anxieties. It's really in the same self doubts. And, um, I, I was just, I'm trying to remember her name. I was just listening to a wonderful scholar get did an interview, uh, with Brene Brown and she was sharing her own anxiety, uh, as a black woman who had achieved, she's written a wonderful book and great achievement and she was talking about her self-doubt and I, I'm thinking I have the same self-doubt and I'm 39, 39 years in business in a world-renowned business with whatever we have 550 employees you know it's and I, I still feel that doubt every day I, I fear like I feel like I'm falling short and I don't know if it's legit so I, I really believe it's a it's a universal truth and then what we can learn to do is to manage that anxiety in a, in a healthy way. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. So I am wondering uh, if you can paint a picture for our listeners. I read a quote, and I don't know if this is your quote or somebody else writing about your, your work, Ari, but it talks about Mozart and music. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, I wrote you know, it. Mozart once said that music is not in the notes, but in the silence in between. And yep. that humility uh, is analogous to that in that Humility is the space between the sounds. And I love that image. And so I'm wondering if you might talk about either yourself or one of your colleagues or somebody else that you mentioned and how they manifest that space between the sounds. I mean, it sounds poetic and lyrical and lovely, but what does that really look like on the ground? Well, I, I think in a way it's it's a funny thing, but it actually doesn't look like anything. That's why it's the space between the sounds. Uh, it's it's uh, part of what has happened in the world, and it, I don't know that it's really new, but I guess it's probably been exaggerated and exasperated in recent years, it is those who make the loudest noise get the most attention. 
And I, I think humility by definition means that, of course, there's times for us to speak. And of course, there's times for us to, in quotes, make noise through our actions. But sometimes, many times, oftentimes, it's really through our silence mm. and our, our ability to keep our mouths quiet mm. and to let others step forward and lead, to ask better questions uh, and, and to watch as others develop and grow and learn to struggle and collaborate as we are because we're all struggling mm -hmm. uh, but I mean I grew up in a loving family where they showed love and affection by cutting you off and telling you were wrong and I it wasn't ill intended it was not a it wasn't ill uh, will it was just habit routine mm -hmm. way of relating and so that's how I grew up so I, I'm with all due respect to my family I'm kind of in recovery from that because I can get triggered with the best of them and learn and, mm -hmm. and start to just react and talk louder and faster. And it's, it's not the end of the world, but it's not great. And so just learning to slow myself down and back up. And then as you described to, uh, in the, as is in the pamphlet, to live in the silence between the notes and mm -hmm. just let things unfold, not to be uh, absent or to abdicate, our responsibility, because as leaders, our, the responsibility is the same, whether we're listening or we're talking, but but to really allow others to come forward and shine. And I, I was actually just, uh, while I was out running today, listening to a podcast with uh, Krista Tippett and a gentleman who I had not heard of named Gordon Hempton, H-E-M-P-T-O-N, who's, uh, it's about silence. And uh, he, he studies silence out in the world and goes out and listens to nature. And it's it just, I was thinking about you. Know, I was going to getting ready to speak to you. And so I was thinking this is a, a perfect segue for it. And uh, with your musical background, of course, it, it, I, I'm honored that it, it resonated for you uh, because anybody who does what you do in the musical world as well as you do and your husband does uh, understand this really even better than I do. Well, thank you. As you were talking, I was actually thinking about music and conducting, which is one of the things that my husband does. So thank you for that. And I will, I will look up that podcast. It sounds wonderful. Sounds very interesting. So Ari, what have you learned since writing the pamphlet? I mean, you kind of started out wondering about it. And as a learner, what have you now pulled in uh, as a result of finishing that? Well, quite, quite a few things, really. Uh... I'll start with a couple and we'll see where we go with that. But so one, one big one was I, I, before I had started this work, I, I think it was clear to me, of course, that people who were very full of themselves and uh, who were not able to ever sit in the silence, but, but needed to be the noise be, uh, in the notes, not the silence between the notes that, mm -hmm. that clearly people when, and we all have ego, when we get caught up in that ego, and we take it to a, a exaggerated state to dominate others, either emotionally uh, or in some cases physically or politically or spiritually, uh, and, and in very bad cases in an abusive way. Uh, clearly, that's not humility. I, I would not have said, though, that people with very low self-esteem are unhumble because I would have thought, well, clearly they're not egotistical, so they must be humble. But I came to through my own readings to change that belief and to really understand that humility is about neither being high nor low. And, and from that, a second learning that, that came to me was really starting to believe that humility is when we're at our, our most human, mm. is when we're in a state of hum, what I came to call humbleness. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can talk about that too. Yeah. I would love to have you say more about that at our most yeah. human. Yeah. So yeah. there's a number of pieces of that. So when we're neither overly full of ourselves nor stuck in the state of self-deprecation, and certainly I can run my cycles on both ends of those <laughs> uh, <we> extremes. <laughs> well, I think we all do that when we can stay centered and it's not that easy when we can stay centered that that's when we're true to ourselves. And that is when we're at our most human, imperfect, uh, open to learning, mm -hmm. frail and fragile, yet resilient. And, uh, and, and so a lot of it comes out of that. And, and then I, I started to also look at the root of the word. 
uh, which I do often. I'm sure you do also oh, yes. because it's always interesting. <laughs> and, 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 and then you mentioned ecosystems and this connected with work I've been doing uh, on, in a way, a different subject. But of course, everything in the ecosystem is related one way or the other. And this turned out to be too. But uh, so humility comes from, from, from humus, uh, from the earth. And uh, of course, in the Bible, Adam, the first uh, man, that his name uh, in Hebrew, Adama, means earth. So, mm. and, and of course, the story in the Bible is that he was created by God from the earth. So regardless of one's religious beliefs is not the point, but it's just that it comes from that same place mm -hmm. uh, of groundedness and, and connection to nature and connection to the earth. So it really came out of that. Uh, and, and that the humus, the topsoil, the most important piece of, of what uh, plants grow in is, is the humus. And in the same way, the most important thing or one of the most important things for growing healthy people uh, in organizations is also humility. Because without the topsoil, plants don't grow well. Without the humility, people don't grow well. Mm. Yeah, thank you. You must have been reading my mind because I went to that root word too. <laughs> So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So Ari, can you talk a little bit about what humility has helped you understand about the state of our country right now? Yeah, I, uh, when I started this study, I didn't really realize at all uh, how important it was going to be in the context of what you just said of understanding the state of society, not like the society, and I'm a part of it, so I'm not looking at it as an outside critic. We're all part of the problem, and we're all part potentially part of the solution. But uh, I, I didn't know when the when we when the pamphlet was going to come out. It was uh, not planned as some sort of massive social statement and commentary. It was just work I'd been doing for a long time. But uh, a couple very current event uh, related subjects that are at hand. So one is if we're in a state of what I now would refer to as humbleness, and we can come back to that in a bit, but if we're in a state of humbleness, we're not better than anybody and we're not worse than anybody. And this is going back to the ecosystem in nature. There's really no hierarchy. Every bun and everything is important. Mm. We're all different. We all play an important role. Uh, in the moment, one person's role might be different as the conductor of the orchestra. Uh, if I'm in the, in the audience and I go to the bathroom, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> if you do, we're the show's in big trouble. doesn't make you a better person or me a worse person. It just means in that moment, you have a particular mm. importance. So it's, it's not, this is not to uh, deny that, that important role that you play, but it just to not tie value as a human being to the role people are playing, or of course, to age, gender, race, religion, political beliefs, and, and to come back to the belief that I have long held, and this goes into the anarchist stuff, that everybody is equitable, everybody is equal, not the same. In fact, no two people are the same, but everybody is equal and that everybody is an important, creative, intelligent human being, and that my job, and I don't get it right every day, my job is to treat them with dignity and, and honor them for who they are. And that's a never ending challenge because I fall short. But, but that's that work. So if we're all coming at our lives, treating everyone as an equal, then racism can't exist. Because racism, anti-Semitism, the belief women can't be leaders, these things all come from hierarchical thinking, mm. which is so implicit, embedded in our culture mm -hmm. that all of us, me included, grew up with it and we don't even know it's happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I tell the, the little anecdote in the book, which I, in the pamphlet, which I didn't make up, but of the two fish swimming along, having a conversation. And the one fish says, yeah, that guy, he's like a fish out of water. And the other fish goes, what's water? Mm. And, and that's really what I've come to realize hierarchical thinking is like. And, and it's so uh, endemic that people unwittingly just, we just fall into it. So people say like, what's the most important thing we need to know? What's the key element? What's the biggest mistake you've ever made? What's your biggest success? What's your proudest moment of your life? And I'm thinking in hindsight, in a natural ecosystem model, why do I have to pick? <laughs> mm. Mm. 
there's no reason to rank them. The, the problem is when we're thinking hierarchically, then either I need to be better than you or you're better than me because we can't really be on par if that makes sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but that's the, that's the way we've been trained to think. And there's a second piece of this too, which I think is, is antithetical to true humility. And that's that we've, we've been trained to hold the belief that we can assign an identity to a group of people. Women do this. You know how men are. And then it degenerates from there into this is how black people are. This is how Jews are. This is how Catholics are. This, and, and it's just, whether it's ill-intended or not, it creates what I would suggest is a dehumanization mm -hmm. that's antithetical to true humility or humbleness. Yes. And so when you combine that kind of group assignment of identity with hierarchical thinking, mm. it doesn't take you long to arrive at the conclusion that either my group's going to be better than yours mm -hmm. or yours is going to be better than mine in a hierarchically minded world who wants to be worse somebody has to be on the bottom. And, and so this thinking manifests uh, in the U.S. a lot through racism. It manifested in Nazi Germany and much of Europe for centuries in the treatment of Jews. There has to be somebody who's pushed to the bottom. Yes, and maybe it's, yes. it was women, it was uh, traditionally women in the household. But, but the point is just to really come at it alternatively from a place of humility, of humbleness, mm -hmm. where we treat everybody with dignity, where we're no better and no worse than anyone else. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I often think about birthright dignity, that everyone has that. And, you know, if we begin there, then <laughs> we create a whole different paradigm, right? Absolutely. I, I, I have come, I wrote a piece about dignity over the summer and uh, I started to realize that's really one of the key metrics I would suggest of a healthy culture, whether it's at our business mm. or, or in society at large. If, mm. if everyone's treated with dignity, we're still going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But if I forget to call you back, but I treat you with dignity, life's going to, you're, you're going to forgive me and life's going to yes. go on. Absolutely. If I, if I slip and, but it comes from a dignity based relationship, we're mm -hmm. going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that was, that's one big piece of current events. And then the other big piece of, is, is it's a pandemic, mm -hmm. which no one alive has been through. Uh, and so humility would dictate that we would ask for help. Humility would dictate that we acknowledge that we don't really know what to do. Humility dictates that we understand our essential helplessness in the face of it, and then together come up with ways to start to address the issues at hand. Yes. Uh, but we, and I don't really per se want to get into politics, but if we have leadership that is not humble, then we flail around intellectually and emotionally trying to hide the problem deny the problem yell at the people who know more than we do mm. so that we we feel better about ourselves mm -hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. and and none of that goes to finding quicker solutions that are more holistically sound so i didn't think about either of those per se when i took on the challenge of learning about humility but uh, as you know and i know i mean the the, the horrible uh, killings over the course of the spring and summer which of course are not really new. I mean, as horrible as they are, it's, we know it's been going on for centuries. Right. Uh, and, and certainly this is not the first time a leader acted unhumble in the face of a crisis, but, but we know that humility and humbleness leads to better outcomes mm -hmm. that help more people. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ari. I wanna just pause here just a moment. Because, you know, what you have been addressing uh, are complex, uh, I'm not going to say complicated, but complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I actually think that there's also simplicity in what you are talking about as well. Because I think human beings at our best, we know, you know, we know how to, we know how to collaborate. We know how to pull together. Yeah. Uh, we know how to be humble. And yet, because of whatever, 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 power systems, hierarchy, uh, whatever is in the air, we, we tend sometimes not to, uh, not to go into that place of humility, to deep humility. Mm -hmm. um, 
I just have to tell you, I know you probably would not say this about yourself. Maybe, maybe I'm maybe too, <laughs> too big of an assumption, but you strike me as a humble leader. And from the moment that I met you over email, <laughs> and then when we had a COVID conversation, not a conversation about COVID, but you know, outside with social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just wondering how you do what you do, managing a very sizable enterprise, a profitable enterprise, sustaining it over four decades. And you talked a little bit about an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can just tell us about yeah. that and how it connects to humility for you. Yeah, I, uh, well, thank you. I spent a lot of years in therapy to learn to take a compliment. So I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> <Mercy>. uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, there's no one thing to answer your question. I mean, really, I, 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 I guess it's funny, but I, because we're here in an academic community i get interview requests from students weekly yeah. i try to actually talk to all of them mm -hmm. um, although i have come to suggest that they do some reading from what i've written before they interview me so i don't need to repeat all of the same stuff from scratch but uh it's funny because they'll all ask me what's the most important thing right the hierarchical thinking so the, the best answer I can give them now is the most important thing or the best advice is to stop looking for the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's many reasons why I have arrived at this ecosystem model and I'm still, it's still evolving. Uh, it, I, I, I started thinking about it back when I was working on part four of the Guide to Good Leading series, which I mentioned is about beliefs. Uh, as I studied beliefs and it became ever clearer to me that all really all of our conscious or all of our behaviors, other than some instinctive reaction, if somebody throws a rock at you or whatever, other than that, every action we take, including you and me being on this podcast together, the work that we do, how we relate to our significant others, the way we treat our colleagues or the person at the drugstore, all of that is based on our beliefs. And, and I started to realize that although no one really talks about those beliefs or rarely talks about them, they are what underlies the actions. And so the image came into my head that the beliefs were very much akin to the root system of our lives. Uh, and, and that uh, you couldn't see them, like I said, but what was happening above ground was always correlated. Alexander Berkman, the anarchist once very helpfully for me said, you can't grow a rose from a cactus seed. So I came to realize you can't, you, negative beliefs will always lead to negative outcomes. Uh -huh. You can make action and, and noise as we've experienced nationally, but you can't really create healthy, positive outcomes except from positive beliefs. And that doesn't mean there's no problems, but you can have a negative belief about a problem like we're victims, or you can have a positive belief, which is, this is horrible. It's a tragedy. It's terrible. Let's get to work and try to do something about it. And then from there, it grew. And I started to realize the culture was like the soil because anybody who does agricultural work, and I'm a city kid, but I've been learning and my girlfriend's a farmer. Uh, the soil's always what holistic farmers, sustainable farmers, organic farmers always talk about feeding the soil because when the soil is healthy, the plants are going to do better. And it's the same in organizations. So if you put you and me with all due respect on a, on a five-year tenure at uh, a fast food franchise with a not super great franchisee, we're just going to be two more cynical people counting the minutes till we can get out of work. And it's, it's not a, said disrespectfully to you or to me. It's just, if you're in an unhealthy soil, it's very difficult to sustain. And then it kept going and hope started to appear as the sun because we all go towards hope. Uh, I think you can see that, unfortunately, through behaviors of the last year on a political level, even when the hope is negative or destructive in the long run, people still go, hopeless people will still, when hope comes for them, will go towards it. Uh, Spirit of generosity, I started to see like water because nothing grows without it. Uh, purpose, I started to see as air because I was reading Rebecca Solnit, whose books I love. And she asked what I know she didn't invent, but I saw it in her book. So I give her credit, which is what goes faster uphill than downhill. And I had no clue. And the answer is wind. So I realized if, if wind or air is purpose, of course, when we're purpose driven, as you know, from your own books and your teaching, 
we go, we'll go work way harder at something difficult that we believe in than we will at, at something we don't believe in, even if it's easier. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, the concept continued to evo has continued to evolve, and now it's becoming clear that it's a whole book unto itself. So it's probably going to be part five in the series. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. But I like it for many reasons. I think I have like 20 on my list, but just to give you one or two, uh, it's not hierarchical, which we talked about earlier. And another thing is that everything impacts everything else. And so hierarchical thinking leads us to weight things out and to say, hey, the elephant is clearly way more important than the bee because look how big the elephant is. And, mm. But of course, we start to learn that in seemingly infinitesimal statistically present things like bees have this enormous impact on the ecosystem. And when they're absent, mm. you don't even notice if you're not a farmer mm. or somebody who keeps bees, but mm. all of a sudden we're not able to, to grow the fruit and grow the food that we need to grow. So mm. in the ecosystem, the greeting that the host gives at the front door of Zingerman's Roadhouse could gain or lose us one of our most loyal customers. Yes. And who cares what I say? that that smile or lack thereof that energy that lack thereof so all of that and then and then also it's very important to understand that everything is impacting everything else and so uh we had some guests last night at the roadhouse who had never been there before their friend brought them uh they're from new york they were blown away by their meal well i'm, I'm gonna bet you they're gonna end up spending way more money at our mail order over the next 10 years mm -hmm. And they and they went home with a coffee cake and the guy's favorite food in his life is coffee cake. So our bakery is going to do well. So although they entered through the roadhouse, the long term impact might be really show up even more uh, prominently in other parts of our organization. So when we understand that we're all related and that uh, how the dignity with which I treat you is impacting my own life, because if yes. I treat you badly, it's going to manifest in a way. I greet Tammy when she comes home from the farm tonight, et cetera. So all of those things are part of the ecosystem. And then the humbleness, uh, as we talked about, is the humus. It's the topsoil. And, and out of that, as I wrote, uh, you probably saw the, the, the piece a couple of weeks ago. I, somebody asked me, and I didn't know the answer, what does humiliation mean? You mm. didn't write about it in the pamphlet. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I didn't. But she's like, well, did you do that on purpose? I'm like, not really. I just didn't think about it. <laughs> So her question got me thinking, and I realized that humiliation, and it's it makes sense. I mean, in essence, it's taking the other person's topsoil. Mm. We're making it hard for you to be human mm. by pushing you uh, to be lower than us. Mm -hmm. And and not shockingly, this is what human beings are doing to the planet. Topsoil is eroding, disappearing at an alarming mm. rate. Uh, it, it, to the point that it's going to threaten our existence on the planet. And oh. this comes also from humans, which includes all of us to some degree, treating nature as if we're better than nature okay. rather than what's true. And I've come to understand, which I never understood as a kid growing up in this in Chicago, where, where asphalt was a comforting phenomenon, uh, that, that we're part of nature and, and that we have a responsibility, but we aren't better than anything in nature. We're just part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I love your systems view and making it an ecosystem, which is pretty, you know, it's hard for some people to understand. Like you said, you come from an asphalt arena. Yeah. And for those of us who are blessed to live in a world with old growth trees uh, as, a, as a natural way of being and breathing, it's a little bit easier to understand. So thank you for writing, Ari. Thank you for, for thinking. Thank you for being. And thank you for breathing life into these ideas, these big ideas, and bringing them down to earth in a way that people can hold on to. And I, I want to ask you just a couple more questions. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, First of all, where do you find time to write? I mean, mercy. <laughs> it seems like you have just so many, you know, well, things going on and your embrace is so wide. Where do you find the time to write? I I wrote an essay on time management in part three of the book, which is on managing <laughs> ourselves. It's a whole, you can have me back and we can talk about time. But I, I, I came to realize that most of us have relatively unhealthy relationships with time. And that the way most Americans talk about time, not consciously, 
if they were to speak about their significant other like that all day, it mm. wouldn't go, it wouldn't go well. Because <laughs> mm. mm. mm -hmm. they're always mad. They're always frustrated. Mm -hmm. They never appreciate it or rarely. Uh, and, and then I, I realized like it's uh, people, like I think about food all the time because I love it and I work with it, but I don't have eating disorders. I just like food and appreciate its beauty. And I'm fortunate that I can afford to eat good food. And I don't mean I'm super wealthy, but I'm doing fine. And I am around good food all day. And I feel really fortunate for that. Many people don't have access to the health, healthful, wonderful, nutritious food that I do. But uh, in the same way, I think it's true at time. And I, I guess I realized that uh, Sam Keen, whose work you probably also know, yes. is another wonderful, humble human being. Yes. Uh, he, he said, we always make time for what we truly want to do. Mm -hmm. And I know this is true. Like, I don't play golf at all, but I, I, I listen to, you know, when we do Zing train work and I listen to whatever, I'm stereotyping, so I apologize, but whatever, bankers, and they're like, I can't get in. That's so, so behind. Da, da, da. And then, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I got two games of golf. I'm like, okay, so you got time to golf. I'm not judging it, but if you got time to golf, then you got time to write. So I, I think for me, it's, it's just a conscious choice to put time into certain places. And the writing is not something I really ever set out to do. I just came to it uh, really out of frustration, to be honest with the way other people were writing our newsletter. And in hindsight, it wasn't their fault. It was mine, yes. but uh, so I, the more I did it, the more I learned, the more I learned, the more I put that to work in the organization, the more it helped us as an organization, the more energy I felt because I was learning. Mm -hmm. And so it got me on a good cycle. So mm -hmm. I just try to be mindful of my time and type fast and keep moving, get over the perfectionism with which I grew up. Yes. Yes. That's really important when you, when you write. So thank you. Thank you, Ari. So my last question for now is, uh, you know, you've, you've spoken a little bit about anarchism, and I would love to hear again in your own words, what is the relationship between what you do, anarchism, and who yeah. you are as well? well I, I talk about anarchism because it's so misunderstood. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Anarchism is about respect for every individual. It's about yeah. freely choosing collaboration and generosity uh -huh. and positive beliefs. It's, it's really a way of being. Uh, and anarchism is perceived to be chaos, but it's actually all about order. It's just that we freely choose order. And in hindsight, studying ecosystems and permaculture, I would actually say that permaculture is anarchism in nature and anarchism is permaculture for people because all the same principles show up in both philosophies mm. about interconnectivity, about getting out of hierarchy, about treating everything and everybody with dignity and respect, about seeing the beauty and benefit that each person brings mm. in their own unique way. So all, all, what I this is a longer story, but I, as I started to restudy it 10 or 12 years ago, uh, because I got asked to speak somewhere else uh, at the Jewish Studies Department, and mm -hmm. Deborah Dash Moore titled the talk Rye Bread and Anarchism, because I had just written a 10,000 word essay on the history of Jewish rye bread, mm. and she knew I had studied the anarchists, and I was getting, once again, I took the agreement to speak, but then I didn't, I'm like, man, I haven't looked at my books in 20 years. I mean, I'm going to look like a, an idiot in front of, like, these are professors who study this stuff and I don't, you know, I'm way out of touch. So I got all my old books out and I started to restudy and it totally blew me away uh, in, 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 a, in a quick sense for two reasons. A, I, I had not realized how much what Paul and I and everyone around us had created was aligned with a lot of those anarchist beliefs that I hadn't consciously done, mm. but it was happening anyway. And then B, more, even more importantly, uh, it just totally hit me upside the head is how much what's now called progressive business was aligned with anarchist thinking. So mm. Mm. getting out of hierarchy, self self-organizing work team mm. flattening organizations engagement mm. these are mm. all take away the business speak it's all anarchist stuff that was being written about 100 years ago because yes. anarchism came as a reaction to the dehumanization of the industrial revolution ah. it's the same although 
many of them did not deal with race very well at the time, but it, it's the same dehumanization that was done that justified mm. racism and hierarchical mm. thinking mm. around the made up concept of race, which of course is a whole nother subject that you know uh, and teach very beautifully about. Uh, so it, it really, I started to realize that all of this stuff you and I have been talking about for the last hour, treating everyone with dignity, positive beliefs, including everybody actively. These are all the themes of progressive life in organizations and they're all themes that are embedded in anarchism. And interestingly, uh, Gustav Landauer, who's an anarchist whose work I never read in school because at the time it was only in German, which I am afraid I'm not able to read, but it was translated about 15 years ago by a guy named Gabriel Kuhn, which allowed me to read it. And it's wonderfully inspiring stuff. He was a good friend of Martin Buber's. He was a pacifist, uh, very spiritual guy. Uh, he said many interesting things, but one that totally blew me away is he said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, the people who pursue the destruction of the state, which is a common theme in anarchist conversations, he said, they're, it's misguided. Because when you're trying to destroy the state, you're locked in a relationship with it in the same way that I was locked in a relationship with my mother while arguing with her, <laughs> refusing to do what she wanted. But in hindsight, it was completely reactive. And so although it felt like I was freeing myself, it's really freedom from, which is a very unfree way to be. Right. And Landauer said, the answer is not to destroy anything, it's to go and create free communities where people can learn to treat each other with dignity, to think freely, et cetera. And when I read that, I was like, oh man, that's what we're doing. <laughs> and the last quote, and I'll leave you alone, is uh, Landauer said, which really helped me understand. He said, we have no political beliefs. We have beliefs against politics. Mm. And that made me realize that anarchism is mm. not a political program. It's not about taking power. It's the opposite. It's a way of life. It's and, and it starts with how I treat you, how I treat Tammy, how I treat myself, so that it's not about gaining power. It's about being powerful in a humble way within ourselves. So yes. uh, it starts with us and it starts with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Ari, again, for being my guest on this podcast, for who you are. Uh, because that's where your leadership comes from and all that you do in the world uh, at Zingerman's and in the community. I just have such high regard and respect for, for who you are and uh, just all that you bring. So thank you again. Well, thank you. I feel the same way. And uh, one day I'm going to get out to Seattle or hear you on stage and, and uh, see you at work. You got to see a tiny bit of, of what I do, but uh, I, I look forward to more conversations to come and, uh, and uh, thank you so much for the honor of being on the show. So inspiring. Clearly, Ari is a leader's leader. He makes a difference in his own life and in the lives of so many others in his own family and throughout the world. In his work as the CEO of Zingerman's Community of Businesses, and as I mentioned earlier, Ari was voted one of the world's top 10 CEOs by Inc. Magazine. Now you know why. They lead differently, all of them, including Ari. They lead in a totally unique way. To learn more about Ari's work with the Zingerman's Community of Businesses, you can go to this website. That's www.zingermans.com www.zingermans.com. And when you go to that site, just be sure to scroll all the way down to the bottom and click on About Us. And you can learn all about Zingerman's vast community of businesses. And you can take a peek at their array of offerings. And hey, why don't you just shop <laughs> while you're online, right? Just shop right there while you're there. If you're just joining us, I'm Dr. Gloria. And this is Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. We just heard from my very special guest, Ari Weinzweig, CEO of Zingerman's Community of Businesses. Now, if you want to make your life count, if you want to be the change you seek, be sure to listen to this episode again and again. And be sure to tell somebody. You can find me right here on iTunes, Audible, Alexa, SoundCloud, 
iHeart, TuneIn, Spreaker.com, Talk Network Radio, and so many other places. Now, before I close, I just want to give a shout out to all the women, men, and young people all around the world, because you know what? We are. We are the ones. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. That means that you don't want to wait for somebody else to step up and make things happen, right? You want to be able to do that for yourself. You can be the one. In fact, you are the one. You are the one who can make a difference in your own life so that you can make a difference in the lives of others. Now, if you happen to miss any part of this week's episode or last week's, you can simply download the recording and listen to it at your convenience at talknetworkradio.com forward slash hosts forward slash legacy living. You can learn more about my work and legacy living make your life count by visiting the Gloria Burgess website and As I've mentioned before, if you love to be inspired, you can actually subscribe to my inspirations right on my website. Just scroll down a little bit, look on the right sidebar until you see the place to add your email address to subscribe to my weekly inspirations. It's that simple. Each week, you get a lovely photograph and a short quotation that inspires you. Or visit me on LinkedIn or Facebook. And that's facebook.com forward slash Dr. Gloria Burgess, Ph.D. You can also find me on the TEDx site and listen to one of my TED Talks. Just type in my name to find me there. Before I close today, I want to thank each one of you for tuning in, for allowing me to share a bit about my journey with what legacy living is all about. Not just living and learning, but living, learning, and serving so that you make a difference in your own life and in the lives of others. It's about being on purpose every single day, 365, 24-7. Legacy living is a powerful way to make your life count. Once again, thank you for joining me for today's show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess. And this is Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. Please join me again next time right here for another episode of Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. Don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what Legacy Living is all about. Have a fantastic day and remember... Make the days in your life count. God bless. That's our show today. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess. I hope you'll join me again next time. Until then... Don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what legacy living is all about. Here's to you. Have a fantastic day and be sure to make it a yes kind of day. Remember to celebrate the music of your life. Make the days in your life count.